Hello and welcome to this conversation about becoming an intelligence-led learning and development team. We're going to look at uh, what's possible now and how that might evolve in the future. My name is Matt. I'm the learning strategy and design team lead for EMEA at Kinio and I'm joined by Pete. Hi, I'm Pete Smith. I am the learning content technical team lead at Kinio and we're joined by a guest here, David. Hi, I'm David Perring. I'm Director of Research for Fosway Group. We're an independent analyst who profile digital learning trends and solutions um, across EMEA. And um, I'm really interested in this subject about being intelligence-led learning team. Fantastic. So where should we start? Let's look at what we're going to talk about today. Um, really, it's about how better data can uh, help inform uh, people within L&D to um, get more value and, uh, and perform better for learners, really. I think one of the interesting things is we see lots of organizations talking about being maybe more data led in how they work. And that's not just relevant to learning it's actually every part of the organization be it marketing sales even the ops team is talking about maybe being a bit more data driven and one of the things we see in Fosway, i think overall is that that creates quite a lot of confusion potentially um and, and in some ways having data and being data-led is not necessarily a differentiator right all of us are swimming in, in oodles and reams and reams and gigabytes i should probably talk in a more way in data uh, and to some extent it's not the data that you've got it's the intelligence that you bring from the data which makes a difference the ability to make better stronger decisions is what I think is probably the most important thing. It's not about having data, it's about actually extracting meaning from it. And I think, maybe call me pedantic, but that's the most important thing. It's about how we become more intelligent decision makers. And to some extent, the data, the analytics, and the AI and all those sorts of things actually are part of that intelligence. Um, so my thing is not necessarily to be blindly led by data. It's to be, to be able to pick out the important trends, the important insights that enable you to make better decisions. Now, Matt, I, 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 maybe I'm being a bit too pedantic around <laughs> that definition. Maybe we should be a bit more relaxed, but I get a bit overexcited by that. Do you, do you think I'm being um, too against the big data mindset, maybe, or just the data focus? Um, am I being too pedantic? Give me some feedback. I don't think so. I think I think there's a really good point that you make, which is about this being a means to an end, really. But you you need to know what that that end is, and we're getting increasing amount of, of opportunity to collect data and to and to use and perhaps process data in different ways. But without knowing what we want to do with that data, having a hypothesis about how we can change our businesses and improve our performance, we're not going to be able to generate the insights that we need. And it really comes down to that question of value doesn't it at the end so what we want to do is not just generate insights but real value for businesses values for learners and, and and really know what that uh what what that can do so that's something that we've certainly looked at at kinio is what's the value that we can add through this new opportunity and this new technology indeed value and and practicality as well because yeah. i think we've all been on a lot of webinars chats in our time which has been quite abstruse, quite abstract. Um, mm. And you you kind of come away thinking, well, what's actually in it for me as an organization? What <laughs> what useful thing can I take away from this? So I think I think you're right, David. Rather than talking in general terms about data and what you can do, it's yeah. coming up with um, practical strategies about how you can take the data, learn something useful from it, and change what you're doing as as a learning provider. Um, from our perspective as as a, a technical team who are delivering learning content so that we can actually come up with something which is clearly useful and has some tangible practical benefits for, mm -hmm. for our clients. And, and in the sort of, I suppose, for learning teams at the moment, and I mean, this is something I reflect on a little bit, is the sort of why is this a hot topic for, for learning teams now, right? Have we reached a, a tipping point of 
the amount of data? Is it about the insights engines that we get access to? The sorts of questions we're now able to interrogate that it's a hot topic right now. What, what is it that sort of made it maybe a little bit more um, prescient in people's conversations? And, and the thing that we see, right, and, and the thing I think about is actually there seem to be some real drivers from the economy at the moment around, do you know what? The money is tight. The CEOs, well, 40% of CEOs think it's going to be a difficult year. Um, and actually, when you look when you look out beyond that um, and say, is people's organizations going to be around in 10 years? A similar sort of number of CEOs say, yeah, if we keep doing what we're doing, we're not going to exist as an organization. So the importance maybe of having a tight climate and also knowing what to do next maybe that is driving an expectation across all functions that we're a bit more intelligence led. Um, but I think that there's something that's happened in our learning teams also personally, right? That digital learning has now been around maybe for 25 years, yeah. maybe 20 years. And all the benefits we used to say of, oh, it's cheaper than classroom training, right? That those benefits have been realized <laughs> so yeah. so to keep saying oh it's cheaper than the classroom stuff that we don't do anymore <laughs> is actually i think raising the stakes a little bit so actually we're in a place of um the economic climate's getting a little bit more tight people are thinking what do we need to change to evolve to be more relevant in the future what we're doing actually people want more effective more efficient learning that's more personalized and I think there's an expectation from the people that L&D serve that says, how come you can't tell me the value that you're driving? How come you can't tell me the effectiveness of what you're doing? I think there's something because I have to report that. Yeah. My sales data has to tell me that, the number of leads I take. So I think there is something about the, almost the focus around learning the value, the, the amount of it's contributing to a business outcome is getting a little bit a little bit more pressing because the almost the, the whole business has matured. Yeah, and maybe learning's being a little bit late to the show. Do, Pete, does that match what you're seeing in in organisations as you talk to your clients? Absolutely. Yeah, there's there's the the push and the pull as yeah. um, that you're describing that going on definitely with the push being budgets are, are tighter. They're being ever more carefully scrutinised businesses need to prove a return on investment at every single level of investment. But at the same time, the technology is is coming along. And the sophistication of a lot of the companies that we deal with has increased. So we've got, we, we, we see a real range actually of um, some organizations who are very, very long way down the data journey where they, they've already got a lot of data. They have a data warehouse, they have data analysts working for them. And they've already hooked up their various platforms, their learning management systems, their LRSs, um, to a central data warehouse that they can then pull data in from other business systems, ERP solutions, um, the CRM solutions, and so on, and actually really start to, to drill into that data. Um, whereas other organizations are, are maybe not so far along, they haven't got that, that sort of tech infrastructure or the bodies that can help them with that. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think that's kind of where the interest is, um, because there's, there's an expectation, there's an understanding that you need to prove value. But I think we're not yet in a position of maturity as, as a business where we, we're really fully explaining our fundamental terms, because yeah. what is impact from a learning perspective? How do you actually start to use the data to demonstrate that the piece of learning content that you've meticulously sculpted yeah. um, has, is actually having a desired effect, that, that people are actually learning from it and also do they need the information that you're imparting to them yeah. it's is this the right learning intervention and are they actually applying it on the job and yeah. if you are seeing a an impact is it the learning intervention which has provided the impact yeah. or is it something else which is going on in the organization is it just those kind of conversations happening at desks or teams yeah. chats which yeah. are, are making the change that you're seeing yeah. so there's in order to actually 
play a useful part, be a useful voice in this whole data conversation which is going on, then we as learning organizations need to be really good and really clear at explaining what impact looks like yeah. when you're looking at the data. Yeah. And I guess that it's quite interesting you sort of touched on two areas there. One was the, the outcomes for the business, but also the efficiency and effectiveness of the program. So if the program was maybe 20 minutes shorter or 10 minutes shorter, does that make much of a difference? Because when you've got a thousand people to train, that starts to add up to quite a lot of money. Or yeah. if we added on another half hour, does that drive better outcomes? Should we be doing more training, less training? Is that approach the way that you presented it to me effective are those some of the questions that you're seeing come to all or is that just a few l d teams that are starting to think about that i think that um it's it's a mix it is a real yeah. mix at the moment to be honest so some are thinking about it and with some they're they're doing different calculations so in yeah. some organizations or with some interventions and seat time is is really of interest yeah Whereas for others, then there's, there's still a compliance um, environment that we live in, and maybe seat time doesn't matter so much because of the potential benefit of, of yeah. ensuring compliance, which way outweighs um, the accumulated aggregated seat time that you're looking at there. But yeah, it's, it's a mix. What, what I think we're seeing there is is some tension, perhaps, between the traditional goal of evaluating the learning success, but also other parts of the business becoming data driven in their own ways. So HR departments, for example, they're asking for you to uh, quantify the amount of seat time because they're becoming very, very data driven themselves. So. Yeah. For us to not be data driven means that we've got almost less of a seat at the table in these business conversations. We can't yeah. really show up, as I think you were saying, uh, yeah. David, to these conversations and say actually what part we're playing within a modern yeah. organization. Yeah, yeah. But it's fascinating, isn't it? I, 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 from my past history of working in telecoms, knowing the, the average call handling time was the, the, the super most important mm. metric for the contact center. And actually every time people walked away, there was a clock ticking. Um, and that was really felt both yeah. in terms of their breaks, now they get some space <laughs> to think about the next thing, but also just in terms of training, if you take people out, I've got a resource that center. And I guess even within how we workforce plan and how we organize who's on what shift at what time, all these things become even more pressing, don't they? They become even more visible when the L&D team says, say, well, yeah, we think half an hour is the perfect time, the perfect duration. It's like, how did you come up with that number? Yeah. And um, I guess we need to have strong answers if we, you say, want to be able to influence and tell people, this is the best solution that we can provide. And I think that is that, as I said before, that sort of, that dial seems to have moved beyond I can see how it was cheaper and more efficient to put it online. We put it online, give me the next game, give me the next game. I think that's one of the, the challenges for us all in learning teams really to articulate that sort of, um, it's almost that it was sort of bang for buck, isn't it ultimately? Yeah. And um, we're all in that place. So I, I, I guess that maybe the next question is about sort of, where are most L&D teams today? What, what we know from our survey is that around 3% <laughs> say that they are advanced or very advanced in measuring the impact on performance and productivity. And actually the vast majority, right? Is, and we did this survey last year using our digital learning results and 80% said that they sort of would maybe planning or just starting in making a difference with measuring outcomes. Now, that hasn't really changed in the last four years. It hasn't really, hasn't probably the dial hasn't moved for a long time. Yeah. And I, I, I suppose it's, what are you seeing, right? in your clients in terms of this, is everybody just starting out? And how do you start off on that journey, I guess? Where do, where do people need to be and how do they get started when actually, if you've not done this before, you're just beginning, it's tough to know what the right thing to do is. It is tough indeed. And I think it's very variable from organization to organization, but also learning initiative to learning initiative. Yeah. If you consider a lot of central uh, L&D teams, they're 
putting the learning through, they're getting the learning out to learners, but they're not the people seeing the changes at the end of the day. They're not the people who can actually say whether it was a complete success or not. Yeah. And they're also limited by the fact that people working with traditional technologies like SCORM and very traditional LMSs, they track whether people have completed the learning or not, but they're not giving them much more information about what's happening within the learning. So it doesn't matter how sophisticated it is, they're still getting a very small amount of information back, which is why technologies like learning content analytics are really great for teams to learn a bit more about what's happening within there. But it still doesn't solve that wider question of how is it transferring to the role? So there's yeah. one, the technology gap that we can start yeah. to fill with products that can see what people are doing within the learning, what they need, gathering better feedback. But also there's a mindset shift about how do we yeah. kind of tie up this entire journey from giving learners the learning to knowing actually what's what's transferred. And those are, those are two different two different matters perhaps that yeah. uh, I think everyone's approaching in different ways. Yeah and, and, and I'm thinking back to what Pete said about this sort of sense of organizations starting to data warehouse and maybe it's worth just sort of explaining what that really means and how maybe L&D teams need to think about how they partner with parts of their organization be that an analytics team or IT team to start to create those connections. And is, is that something that's worth sort of exploring, Pete? I don't know. Yeah, I, I think so, because um, I, I can completely see why you got the results that you got from your, your survey. <laughs> that, that there are lots of people data starved. It. And it's yeah. a lot of the, a lot of the root causes platforms. So one of the reasons why we've been working on um, uh, our own Kineo Analytics solution is that most clients have got a big homogenous learning management system that they use. These are big, expensive platforms. They're very, very good for what they do. Um, but the, the data that they, they actually offer up to our clients is quite limited. It, they're still mostly using SCORM. So they're mostly tracking yeah. completion, time in course, score from assessment. Right. That's about it. And, and so then if they moved up the SCORM hierarchy of I, I i'm going back in my, into my distant memory of score 1.2 and then again it seems a long time ago 2004 score yep. and i think that's where it ended wasn't it sort of, it, it was that. you've got various different editions of score 2004 but yeah. um for all practical purposes we're still tracking the same bit of data um yeah. that we that we did with score 1.2 we're still using score 1.2 for probably 50 60 percent of the course wow because really? it it does what you need it does the basics so obviously yeah. xapi was supposed to come along sorry i, I should probably yeah. not talk about the standards too much oh. it was it was <laughs> supposed to change everything <laughs> but the short version yeah. is it hasn't we yeah. do have some clients who are lucky enough to have a learning record store and who are able yeah. to get richer data through xapi yeah. but most are still limited to score yeah. which really restricts your data um, and so what some clients have been able to do is um, get extra tools, an extra source of data. So what the basic model that you follow is you have various different systems um, which gather different data from different areas, and then you have a central data warehouse and you integrate the whole lot of them. Mm -hmm. um, and if you can if you can do that, so that needs input from your IT team. So it needs buy-in from the IT team. You need to get hold of some resources to actually set up the tunnels between the various systems and carry out the data integrations. A lot of the big tools that our clients use for so the, the LMS is like the cornerstones yeah. and the success factors of this world yeah. do have APIs. Okay. So they they mostly have pre-built um, features which allow you to integrate them quite easily with a data warehouse, but you still need to get tech resource time. Yeah. And you, as a um, in the learning and development team, are fighting yeah. for resources always yeah, with sure. the various other production teams. Um, so you've got a bit of a battle on your hand to get hold of resources, which right. are inevitably scarce. Yeah. Um, there can also be a, a bit of a, an infosec consideration as well, because where you're dealing with third party systems, you need to get right. all of your, your DPIAs done so that everyone's oh, okay. data is being dealt with securely yeah. um, for 
companies who are based in Europe or have significant operations in Europe, you need to make sure that the workers' councils are happy with what's yeah. been done. So there's yeah. potentially quite a lot of work involved in actually right. getting that, that high quality data that you need. Yeah. Um, so, in so, so it sounds like already I'm thinking there's three different sort of connections you've got to make. One is with your legal team to make sure that you've got the ticks in the boxes around the proper use of data and it's being used in a, the appropriate way. Um, and maybe they can also deal with the workers' council if you're in Germany. You've got the IT integrations team who are going to make sure that the connections work. And you've also potentially got the analytics, um, business analytics uh, analysts, if I can call them that, who can help start to interrogate and create the reports for you as well. And that sounds um, like... Uh, because I'm, I'm assuming that most L&D teams aren't going to have the um, data scientists or the analytics programmers, whether, regardless of what tool they're using, who can actually generate something for them. Absolutely. And also you've got to work with the third parties as well, assuming that you're using a third party learning management system. So, yes, wow. there's, yeah. there's a lot of a lot of people that you need to get in a room together. Yeah. When you see organizations start to do this, what sort of time frames is an L&D team trying to work with? And maybe they're partnering even maybe with their own um, customer services director or technical director to put an extra put a pressure on the IT group. Um, how long are they thinking about a six month project? It's, it doesn't sound like something that gets wrapped up in a couple of weeks. It could be a couple of weeks. It's one yeah, of those okay. things where it's yeah. it's a matter of how high a priority the right. business ascribes to oh, it. Okay. Yeah. Because it, the actual technical piece isn't that difficult. Yeah. Um, it's all of the the work around it, the impact assessments, the getting buy-in, the persuading people yeah. that you're top of the priority list, yeah. um, and battling with other priorities inside the business. Yeah, yeah. Those are time-consuming bit. The tech's actually yeah. quite straightforward. Yeah. I think that, that's a rare hope. <laughs> <laughs> Ray of hope in what I thought was going to be much more um, a mountainous, but it sounds like it's the internal bureaucracy that's a little bit more mountainous than the technical execution. And Sadly. One, <laughs> I suppose that's true everywhere, isn't it? Almost, unless you're a small, maybe more agile organisation. Um, most will have a process and an IT sign-off and a governance board. Yeah, I can see all that blocking on. XAPI was maybe supposed to be a bit of a leap forward. What stopped that sort of making Gaby getting traction? And I maybe touched on that a little bit already, but I think it's really interesting to say, was XPI, XAPI the real savior? Um, and why hasn't it delivered maybe to expectations? It's, um, I mean, it was always meant to be a savior. It's meant yeah. to solve the fundamental problem of SCORM, which is SCORM is yeah. very limited as to what you can track. And it's also limited by the fact that what you're tracking has got to be launched from a learning management system. So yeah, with XAPI, yeah. you've got that flexible structure of um, uh, act verb objects. And okay. so you can track anything that you want. Yeah. And it theoretically makes it easy to integrate other systems so you don't just have sure. to use a learning management system you have a central learning yeah. record store and you've got lots of different things feeding xapi statements into it mm -hmm. it was that flexibility though which i think was was right. has been its downfall because yeah a lot of the subsequent work with xapi has been to come up with a really good strict definition along a scormy okay. sort of lines of the things that people do want <laughs> to track so that you yeah. don't have this proliferation of verbs which yeah that same thing okay. um the the other part of it's costs so the, yeah. the big lms's were really slow to incorporate sure. um, an lrs into their um architecture yeah. because it wasn't really in their interest to suddenly right. have learning data um mm. off in other systems it, it kind yeah. of it works better from a learning management system perspective yeah. if everything yeah. is in that one homogenous system yeah. um and so there's a lot more expense for a client to have to go out yeah. and source another supplier to provide a learning record store and then yeah. start to do all of the the data integrations so i think that's yeah. why it's not taken off in the way that people yeah. would hope and, and where it did take off i'm assuming that's where actually maybe there was a little bit more business alignment a little bit more business intent where actually the pressure from the stakeholder 
was to really understand a little bit more of that granularity. So that almost drove the addition of the LRS into the um, LMS, I guess. But again, I'm, I'm, I'm making it up a little bit there. So uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong. No, I, I think that is the case, but also I, I do. Yeah, it's it's the the expense and the complexity of getting yeah. an LRS involved. And again, this is one of the drivers behind Kineo Analytics that we saw that XAPI just wasn't getting the market penetration that we wanted. Yeah. We knew that we needed to find a way of getting this extra richer data yeah. um, for our clients. And so we, we just had to take a a different approach. The tack that we took was a much more lightweight Google Analytics style approach, okay. um, yeah. which allows you to get data out of a course without having to um, encourage a client to build to have to buy a new platform, which is hosted yeah. specifically for them. So it's yeah, it's a yeah. lower cost of entry. Yeah, but it gives you maybe the sort of level of fidelity and insight that people would expect to get through just the natural web environment, right? And uh, maybe the, the level of uh, granularity even about exactly what's happening at what point in a way that you maybe wouldn't be able to get that from other sources but so easily. Yeah, it gives you a way of getting complementary data. Yeah. And so XAPI is still very focused on the individual. It's basically mm -hmm. SCORM, but more flexible. Yeah. Whereas there, there are other types of data which are more useful. So if you go to anyone who works in marketing, they will use some form of analytics package yeah. and they don't really care about the individuals. The, right. the packages do track down to an individual level, but yeah. what they're much more interested in is patterns of behavior and how people um, as an audience interact with a website or some piece of digital content. Yeah. Because that then allows you to see patterns of behavior analyze those patterns of behavior, change that behavior, and so make tweaks to the interface to yeah. try and um, change the way that people progress through a website, yeah. um, complete a sale. So you can identify um, things that you need to change in your website in order to have particular outcomes yeah. and objectives. And yeah. you can also profile your users. So you have profiles based around archetypes or personas yeah. or however you want to do yeah. it. Um, and use those to carry out a bit more analysis into yeah. how people are behaving. Yeah, but that sounds really interesting, right? So to some extent, you're bringing this sort of um, marketing orientated view of, uh, of, of how people interact with, with a, as a brand and taking that perspective and saying, OK, if learning's a brand or is it provides a product, how are people interacting with that in a similar way? So you can make those sort of business decisions about is it driving some of the right outcomes is it driving the right efficiency or effectiveness as well because you're able to sort of track those broader trends so where we really want to start is with great objectives that's something that's close to our hearts at Kineo everything we do with a piece of learning has to have those good objectives so we know what we're delivering against and it's the mm -hmm. same with the data so we stop with good objectives good learning objectives and then we can start to try and make predictions about what we want to change but not mm -hmm. just further down the line but also what do we want to see happening within the learning that gives us an indicator a predictor of these new behaviors so we like to break this down into a few different dimensions we call these yeah one's around competence so that's how do you apply the knowledge how can you apply yeah. the knowledge in an activity or a simulation or a scenario yeah. um how might your confidence change so what areas of perception so it could be confidence it could be other things but how yeah. might that change at the beginning of doing a piece of learning and, and at the end sure. Yeah. Uh, what's the engagement throughout? So those things that are that, uh, that more traditional type of analytics approach where it's it's just seeing what you're doing, how long you're spending, uh, yeah. how long it takes. Are you skipping over stuff? Are you spending more time in certain areas? That sort of um, data and then reaction as well, which still has yeah. its place. We know from face to face training and the happy sheet, it's not the be all and end all, yeah. but it's useful combined with other pieces of data. To, yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to gather those those feelings that we wouldn't get otherwise. So if we can look at those sort of uh, angles, those dimensions, and work out what data we might want to collect within a piece of learning, we can start to build the learning yeah. with that data mindset, with that data strategy in mind. Yeah. And then this is, this is for one piece of learning. 
yeah, we, yeah, yeah. we can expand that to be multiple pieces of learning or to be you know building yeah. on it year on year to make it better so we can start mm -hmm. to use this combined wisdom across you know multiple rollouts of the same subject or even across an entire portfolio of learning as to how people are, are performing within the learning what they're liking what they're using yeah. uh, what's actually transferring and then if we do go to the nth degree of measuring the actual performance in the role yeah. we know that online learning and any kind of traditional learning intervention type approach sits within those kind of like bottom levels of the evaluation kind of models there's several out there but it's within those lower yeah. levels where this sits we can really round out what we know is going on yeah. within those lower levels and that can help us to to work out how that's built the foundations for for that kind of higher level of evaluation so we can start to track that route straight through so those yeah. are some ways that we can we can start to build a strategy around it it's quite yeah. quite traditional actually but it's it's working yeah, in a way yeah, that's yeah. really in tune with with the new kind of tools and techniques that we have yeah so you're, so you're really able to get into the heart to some extent of when people go through a learning program where they spend their time and they're struggling to absorb it because they get maybe lower results so there's a higher amount of effort and potentially not a great deal of recall or a great deal of understanding and that could be a combination of maybe the questions are too hard or actually the explanation is not great but you can start to highlight in a even within a series of programs where those sticky points are maybe or maybe where there's not enough challenge because actually people are skipping through it, <laughs> don't really read the content and they still get 100% um, without without breaking a sweat. So it, it really gives yeah. you the level of understanding, that intelligence to say, this is what's working, this isn't working, this needs some attention. And, 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 and do you take the answers just from within the system or is that a trigger to go and dig deeper with customers and users and how do you make it meaningful about what maybe went wrong in a program people are uh, keep on bombing out for example yeah so it can, it can be completely both something can be yeah. quite clear cut we could find out that actually our audience are just unanimously getting everything correct in this learning yeah we know that they're, yeah. they're great at it and that's that can mean the pretest. so if they're racing the yeah, pretest, yeah, yeah, yeah. we know we might be kind of overtraining this a bit because right. everyone's passing the pretest. Yeah. But it might be that actually people are consistently getting one question wrong. And then we do yeah. need to have to ha have to ask ourselves, do people need more training? Is the question yeah. phrased in a way that's being misleading and we need to do the investigation. And sometimes that only comes from looking at the wider assumptions that we've made about the learners when we've constructed that package. So we need to go further yeah. and really try and understand them for understand that yeah. more. But without that data, we don't know that learning is a sealed box. We can't, yeah, yeah, we can't, yeah. we can't see those points where and those opportunities to, 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 to make this better. Yeah, and, and, and in terms of sort of bringing in other variables, if that makes sense. So, be that a performance review, or mm. may, it might be a, a quality assurance system, right, where people are being checked, or it might be just the managers going through and saying, "Yeah, David's got a little bit better at this," or still no improvement. Is that part of the sort of wider connection into HR process that you're also able to make, or is that sort of off the out of the field of vision at the moment? I mean, it, it is, it is because people yeah. can take the the insights from the the online learning analytics, and then mm. they can take those and they can combine them themselves with this other data. I mean, none of it exists mm. in the same place at the moment. Mm. That's why we've talked about that yeah, data yeah. warehousing type approach. Yeah. But it also starts a conversation that people might not have had yet, which is, mm. well, if we collect this information here, if we collect this data here, and we collect this data here, and we collect this here further down the line, what story can we tell? And, and, yeah. and, and what can we discover? Because uh, at the moment, I think there's a presumption we can't get a lot from the learning. We don't, we don't know a lot, so therefore yeah. you can't really cross-reference it with with this but actually we, we can start to gather more than we have done before and yeah. then we start we can start to look at well if we know this from the learning how can we then follow that up within yeah. the, uh, the performance reviews and how can we compare that to i mean it goes back to the call center analogy the, the average yeah. call time 
or, yeah. you know, or the uh, the customer satisfaction, what metrics are there that we can track through all of these? So it starts a really ex exciting conversation about how we can join it all up. Yeah, and they, I guess they also... are. So go on, Pete. Oh, sorry, Dave. I was just going to say that so they, they are slightly different use cases, though, between yeah. gathering data to help an individual through a mm -hmm. performance appraisal yeah. and the overall goal of a piece of learning. So if we go back to our call yeah. center one, so if you have some sales yeah. training, then the overall goal of that e-learning is to have a demonstrable effect or an improvement mm -hmm. on the uh, number of conversions that you're seeing mm -hmm. in the sales data. And they're, they're two slightly different things. One is dealing with an individual individual performance. The other one is dealing with yeah. simultaneously um, looking at whether the learning intervention was successful from the how can we improve the learning intervention perspective, yeah. but also looking at the has overall has it shown value has has the have the numbers yeah. moved in the direction that we want them to. And yeah. what and what can we do next strategically? So do we need more of this? Do we need to focus on a particular subset of the training that we've done? Where do we take it next? Mm -hmm. And it's more those latter questions that yeah. are the sort of strategic questions that yeah. we're trying to answer with yeah. the but, it, but it's interesting, isn't it? Because you almost get this sense of there's two layers, and maybe I'm under, under maybe miscounting, but maybe there's more, but I'm going to pick out two layers of continuous improvement. There's a continuous improvement within learning and the learning team, not only within what they do generally, but within that particular program as well. So that sort of is a, a shaping a sense of continuous improvement within what we deliver and how we provide it to our customers, but also that sense of continuous improvement within the business about yeah. what goals we now are achieving. I think it's really interesting because I, I think back to my days when I used to be involved in digital learning or, or e-learning back in the day, we were so intent on moving on to the next project. It was like, we didn't really probably take enough time to say, was it the most effective? Was it the most efficient? Could we have tweaked this in a different way? We've used a few different type approaches, even within e-learning, maybe a bit more story-based, maybe a little bit more factual, a little bit more simulation-based. And we've used those through. What actually drove a better outcome? We were too busy moving on to the next project, but there sounds to be a sort of point of, a real after action review point, yep. um, not just at the end of the big project, but actually we've done the first pilot. How is it working? Because actually, if we can prove the effectiveness on the first thousand, if we're going to put this out to a hundred thousand, there's loads of efficiency we can offer the business as well as a better experience because we fine tuned it as we've gone. And I guess that's something that, um, yeah, if I'm, I put my hand up and say guilty, right? <laughs> I was guilty of just thinking, do the next project because there was so much to do, but that actually this gives us a really good um, review point, a really good marshalling point to say, sit back, think about not running a thousand miles an hour all the time, but just take a breather and say, what's the next best thing to do? And that's maybe being much more intelligent sled, which was maybe the, the, the basis of um, this whole conversation in its own right anyway. Yeah, indeed. And I think what we're finding is we've got um, a lot of clients who are starting to think more along those those lines, a bit less about the, the single inter interventions, more about the overall approach and how they can improve over time. I think we're seeing more piloting and that sort of approach than we perhaps used to once upon a time, because people genuinely want to kind of crack this nut. Yeah. Of, of what is effective learning, you know, what is the value? And if I spend this much on this, yeah. What's the return? Um, yeah. So there's a lot of appetite. There's certainly yeah. a lot of appetite. And it, and it sounds as though it's also sort of hit that sort of um, sweet spot of where organizations are being more agile. So actually it's about minimum viable product. You don't have to give everything in mm. one go. Let's start to pilot, improve, evolve. And actually we're almost in a continuous speech. And that's, that's a little bit tough maybe for learning teams totally to embrace that we never really had a finished article. We were always improving it because there are issues of compliance. But actually getting to that early gate point of was it good enough? What could we do to improve it before it goes to everybody? It's a really positive way, isn't it, of getting better engagement from learners, getting better promotion from um, within the organization, better advocacy, better stakeholder management to prove it's making a difference as well. So I can see loads of spin-offs just around that sort of agile mentality linked with having a much more intelligence driven approach um it sort of is a perfect fit isn't it in a way 
Exactly. Yeah. Minimal viable learning. So yes. <laughs> it, it, it's not talked about. And then, and then, yeah, iteration after that. And it is, it's a real, real change of mindset. And certainly it's, it's not something that we're seeing generally in the market. For the most part, we're, we're still exactly where you were, David, where it's a case of build something, throw it over the fence. I know that most of our clients will yeah. do some extra analysis to see how well it's gone down and get all sorts of feedback statistics. But very often we as an agency don't see that. Yeah. Um, we, we very, very rarely um, go back to a course within well, any less than 12 months, very rarely. Yeah, but it's sad, isn't it? I, again, thinking, thinking back, we're, I just remember my team being so busy, we were running so fast. You just think, yeah, um, if people invited us back, that was a win because there was so much to do. Um, but that wasn't necessarily a good bar to set. I think, and, and I think when we talked a bit earlier on about the sort of the expectations have grown, I think that's the sort of thing that actually most digital learning leaders or learning leaders have now got to cope with a world that's not 15 years ago, it's now, and those expectations are so much higher. So where are your clients starting to make sure this is being successful? I mean, I, I think both myself and Matt, we've probably got quite different Ooh. answers to this, but I, <laughs> okay. I think that we're, with a lot of a lot of clients, then it's it's kind of start with the basics because yeah. we're, we're in that basic thing. So yeah. getting better quality descriptive analytics mm -hmm. will be really, it's a good starting point. Yeah. And then you can move on to, to diagnostic very rapidly after, after getting better descriptive. So I think um, the main thing to do is just focus very very much on objectives what's the yeah. course supposed to do what does success look like make sure that you're doing all of those basics of defining that beforehand build your hypotheses around what you what you feel you can see and then um there, there are a lot of very very um creative ways of getting that data it mm -hmm. doesn't need to be a big platform purchase yeah. You can get it through other sources from within the business. Yeah. Um, so I think think about what those data sources could be. Yeah. And, 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 and Google Analytics sounds like it's a low cost entry point as well, right? It doesn't sound like it's something that it has the proprietary costs of a, a, a super analytics engine, right? It sounds like you can make some progress very quickly without the IT guys falling off their chair or saying you need extra licenses for what? You, you can. It's it's cheap from a sort of um, starting cost perspective. Yeah. We've we have used it a, a bit in the past. We tried to push yeah. it really hard as a useful way of getting extra data, sure. but we did still find that there were still yeah. security concerns and a lot of right. organizations. It was a reluctance of having even anonymous data landing on Google's wow. servers because yeah. Google is quite good at turning anonymous data into personally identifiable <laughs> information. If, or let, let me let me be a bit more fair to Google. It is possible to turn anonymous data into PII through sure. um, slightly careless use of of the interface. Right. So the, sure. there's still caution around that. But as long as it's allowed by the organization, then yes, Google right. Analytics or some other analytics package which has been signed off already by your InfoSec yeah. teams is a really good yeah. way in. Yeah. And Matt, is there something that's, that's worth adding to that just to sort of round out the, the conversation? Because we started off on the premise yeah. of sort of being intelligence led. And I think mm. we've gone on a really great journey of actually moved beyond the data. We talked about the practical experience and, and where mm. we talked a little bit about where you start, but is there something in the mindset of L and D, a particular set of understanding that they should start to educate themselves around to help accelerate themselves forward? Yeah, uh, definitely. There's there's three things that do spring to my mind. One of which I completely agree with Pete when it comes yeah. to really set good objectives, make those performance yeah. objectives. Don't just think about content and checking knowledge think about mm. the change that you want to make and then think about the data around that the second is just being willing to fail you know the yeah. data is not always going to say it was a roaring yes. success sometimes yeah. it's going to you're going to learn that you need to change stuff but that's a really important part of having that data and the alternative is failing and not knowing and that yeah. you, you are always in a better 
better state to have that data and react to it. So being willing to fail. Yeah. But amongst all of that, the other thing that people can do is really learn how to tell good stories with data. So the reason you're collecting this isn't just so you as the L&D team can, uh, can talk about it, it's so that you can talk to the business about your success or about your learnings or about how you've developed your strategy based on what you've learned. So there are loads of resources about data stories, things like that, and yeah. telling really compelling narratives with the insights that you gain. So getting yeah. better at doing that, I think, is a great step for people to, to, to win that enthusiasm, enthusiasm in the business for, for making data yeah. a, a, you know, an everyday part of, of the learning activities. Yeah. And I love that because I think that's something I always think about is when you're within a big organization as a learning department, it's about who you influence around what, how well you know your stakeholders, what are their hot buttons that gets them excited and energized, what do you need to start to, what sort of language you even need to speak to get mm. them to take you seriously, and actually bringing a little bit of that data about the, the effectiveness of what you're doing. People always respect the fact that you've said, we start on this journey, we're going to change it because it's more effective if we do. Doing the same thing that doesn't work is probably the sign of stupidity, right? The complete opposite of intelligence. Yeah. And I think that's the thing about being intelligence-led is it is about those stories. It is about influencing. It is about trying to get people to do the better thing and doing. And, and I love what you said about failing. It's like fail fast, get it right yeah. faster. And I think that sort of all fits into that agile mentality that actually I think most organizations are now in that mindset of um, let's be agile, let's deliver value fast. Um, don't do necessarily do the whole thing. So I think we've gone through a great journey. I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of the time ticking on. Um, and, I, and I feel sorry that I feel as so I've interrogated you, you more than I we might have expected. <laughs> but I think we've got it's to reach your outcome because it's the expertise that you have from your customers, right? You're speaking yeah. through the voice of your customers. And I think that is what makes it really interesting that people are pushing the boundaries, right? Continuous improvement around my learning, and continuous improvement about the business doing things faster, more impactfully, is a sweet spot today. It is. And at the end, it's all about getting to know learners better and doing best by them yeah. so they can perform in a job yeah. that they enjoy and, uh, and everyone gets the most out of that. Yeah. Love that. Thank you.